Bien, eh, buenos días a todos. Eh, a nombre de la Facultad de eh, Estudios Interdisciplinarios de la Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú, les doy la bienvenida a, a todos ustedes a esta a este primer foro de, de, de varios que vamos a tener en, en temas de mucho interés, en este caso eh, los organismos genéticamente modificados, ¿no? un tema bastante este, complejo ¿no? eh, y que queremos tratar de una manera bastante imparcial. Eh, el día de hoy nos acompañan dos expositores de mucho nivel y esto vamos a, a repetirlo eh, varias veces en, en este año. Aparte de otros eventos que también tenemos programados eh, desarrollar eh, en la facultad. En, en particular en este caso en el programa de gastronomía. Nada más, espero que disfruten de estas de esta do, dos charlas y luego entraremos pues en una discusión para poder eh, conocer mejor el, el tema. Lo dejo con Carisa Becerra, que es la coordinadora del programa y la que ha trabajado en este, en este foro, este primer foro, que espero le, eh, les guste a todos. Gracias. Gracias, César. Eh, buenos días a todos, buenos días a nuestros ponentes y, y, y a nuestra moderadora Pamela Antonioli. Este, muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos. Yo también voy a ser bastante breve porque queremos escucharlos. Este es el primero de un ciclo de foros que se denominan Moratoria y Organismos Genéticamente Modificados, Enfoques Interdisciplinarios, como, porque como dijo César, lo que queremos es buscar diferentes puntos de vista para este tema, ya que tenemos este, esta situación eh, en donde tenemos que tomar una decisión sobre la moratoria de, de los transgénicos hacia el Perú. Y bueno, eh, yo quisiera simplemente y rápidamente agradecer a las personas que nos han ayudado a, a sacar adelante este, esta primera fecha y, y que nos ayudarán en todo el resto de, del ciclo de foros, a Jorge Bentín, a Jorge Achata y a Gonzalo Urbina, por ayudarnos a, 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 a entender mejor el tema y ayudarnos a plantear los problemas. Bueno, los dejo con Pamela Antonioli, este, ella es biotecnóloga, experta en innovación abierta y gerente del Hub de Innovación Minera del Perú. Entonces, lo de, la, los dejo con, con ella para que les presente a los superponentes que tenemos hoy día y, y bueno, hagan sus preguntas y ella les explicará cómo. Y acá estamos. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, eh, Carisa. Quiero agradecer infinitamente a la Facultad de Estudios Interdisciplinarios de la Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú, que me ha invitado a moderar este panel, y también felicitarlos, porque considero que hoy más que nunca la sociedad necesita espacios alturados de debate y discusión como este. En un mundo globalizado e hiperconectado, que nos inunda de una cantidad de información que creo yo era impensable para generaciones anteriores, se torna de vital importancia el pensamiento crítico. Ojo, no la crítica, el pensamiento crítico. No solamente para la selección de la información con sustento y de fuentes fiables, sino para la toma de decisiones. La ciencia avanza, los desarrollos son cada vez más complejos e involucran distintas ramas del conocimiento, pero la tecnología, así como la innovación, finalmente son herramientas. Es estas herramientas cuyo uso e impacto lo determina la sociedad. El tema que hoy nos reúne es un tema complejo. Y son los temas complejos los que necesitan un esfuerzo mayor de comunicación y sensibilización para poder entenderlos a cabalidad y poder identificar los grandes beneficios que nos puedan traer, así también como los potenciales riesgos. Finalmente, necesitamos espacios como estos, porque más allá del cariz científico-tecnológico del tema, es en el diálogo abierto y en la evidencia que se construye una respuesta que permite avanzar a la sociedad. Hoy más que nunca necesitamos dejar de lado Discusiones planas, de negro blanco, hay muchos tonos de grises y no necesitamos eh, una sociedad polarizada, necesitamos discusiones abiertas y tolerantes. Eh, los invito entonces a ponerse en modo apertura, por favor escuchemos, eh, evaluemos, analicemos, saquemos todas estas características que nos ayuden a, a ser mejor como personas y como especie en este planeta, y eh, empecemos entonces, los invito a participar en este ciclo de foros de moratoria y organismos genéticamente modificados de enfoques interdisciplinarios. Eh, tienen en el chat eh, la posibilidad de hacer comentarios y consultas que serán eh, leídas eh, al final de la ponencia de nuestros expositores. Les recordamos también que en, la, en, en la, el menú de abajo tienen una alternativa de interpretación 
eh, el cual podrán poner eh, a modo español en el caso de la exposición en inglés. Entonces tenemos esa opción también de traducción simultánea. Y eh, me permito, sin, sin más demoras, a presentar a nuestros ponentes del día de hoy y agradecerles infinitamente su presencia hoy. Eh, tenemos a Alan Bohanik, eh, PhD, actualmente representante de la FAO en Colombia, pero también se ha desempeñado como representante FAO en Brasil, director técnico del Centro Internacional de Agricultura Tropical CIAT de Santa Cruz, Bolivia, director ejecutivo de la Secretaría Nacional para el Medio Ambiente de Bolivia, entre otros cargos en instituciones estatales. Alan es doctor en Economía Agrícola de la Universidad de Londres, del Reino Unido, en Economía del Medio Ambiente de la Universidad de Utrecht, Países Bajos, y en Ciencias Políticas de la Universidad de Costa Rica. Tiene una licenciatura en Ingeniería Rural de la Universidad Gabriel René Moreno de Santa Cruz, Bolivia, y un diploma en Economía Agrícola de la Universidad de Reading, el Reino Unido. Bienvenido, Alan. Eh, por favor, eh, estamos atentos a tu ponencia. Uh, okay. Bueno, muy buenos días a todas, a, a todos. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Un honor estar con ustedes, acompañarles y, y tratar este tema que todo el mundo sabe es un tema polémico, es un tema, eh, como muy bien eh, fue dicho, eh, donde tiene muchas cosas grises y todavía tiene mucho por terminar de entenderse, pero la idea es desde una uh, visión amplia, de una visión, yo diría hasta de cierta neutralidad, el poder abordarlo el tema, ¿no? Y eso es lo que voy a tratar de hacer. No vengo con una posición, porque además represento una organización que no ha fijado posición en el tema, y de un lado y del otro, es decir, los que están a favor y los que están en contra puedan condenar a, eh, cómo es posible que nosotros no tomemos una posición, pero la, la, la um, explicación es muy sencilla, ¿no? Muy sencilla. Nosotros somos una agencia de Naciones Unidas, una agencia que tiene 197 países uh, que son como nuestro board, son nuestra junta directiva, es un, en realidad como un club y los socios son un poco los que deciden los temas, los socios uh, son uh, de alguna manera los que toman las grandes decisiones, que son los ministros de Agricultura de los 197 países que se reúnen en una conferencia cada dos años y en una conferencia también cada dos años a nivel región, aquí para América Latina, eh, dentro de un mes, menos de un mes, dentro de tres semanas vamos a tener la conferencia para América Latina, de todos los ministros de Agricultura, donde aprueban nuestras orientaciones. ¿no? Entonces, no hay un tema que nosotros podamos eh, eh, tomar una posición sin consultar al board. ¿no? Y este es un tema de ellos, hay 55 países dentro del FAO que se oponen a los transgénicos, que tienen tolerancia cero a los transgénicos y que tienen implicaciones inclusive para, para el comercio. ¿no? Entonces nosotros no podemos contradecir una, una decisión de 55 países. Igual de aquellos países que están a favor, no, eh, no podríamos adoptar una posición total. Entonces tenemos una posición de alguna ambigüedad tratando de mantener la evidencia científica, tratando de colocar los temas, los pros, los contras, para que este, obviamente los países puedan tomar la decisión. Si un país, por supuesto, decide adoptar los transgénicos, nosotros estamos en, eh, para apoyar. Y lo mismo si un país decide no aceptar transgénicos, por cualquier razón que sea, también estamos para apoyar en esas decisiones. Entonces, por eso que nosotros tenemos esa cierta ambigüedad, ustedes eh, van a ver muy pocos documentos de FAO donde podamos tener eh, una posición al respecto. Lo que sí, hay documentos donde ilustramos, mostramos resultados de investigación, mostramos resultados uh, de cómo se ha hecho uh, a nivel de, de determinados países, ¿no? apoyamos uh, cuando se trata de legislar, pero inclusive nosotros tenemos una responsabilidad muy grande que es la del Códex Alimentario. ¿no? Ustedes sabrán que... El, Códex Alimentarios es una especie de normativa, de marco normativa para el comercio internacional. Es un, es un uh, estándar donde los países se ponen de acuerdo sobre qué es aceptable, qué niveles de, de, de ciertos productos son admisibles, qué niveles no son admisibles, qué cosas pueden eh, transarse en el comercio internacional. 
eh, y, y van a ser aceptados por el otro. Contribuimos muy fuertemente a, a, a la toma de decisiones en el marco de la OMC, pero en el tema de transgénico no hay tal. No hay un capítulo de transgénicos en el Códex Alimentario. Hay alguna referencia, pero no hay un capítulo como tal. Y lo mismo en la OMC. ¿no? En la OMC también ha sido un tema muy polémico. Ustedes saben que Estados Unidos se dice es el paraíso de los transgénicos. Estados Unidos ha tratado de poner mucha presión para que estos sean aceptados, pero ha habido también mucha contrarreacción y también es un tema que no ha sido del todo legislado ni acordado en el marco de la OMC. Eso es un tema que trata de ser, eh, no, no voy a decir evitado, pero por lo menos eh, eh, donde es difícil llegar a consensos y, y acuerdos y poder normar esos acuerdos. ¿no? Entonces, dicho esto, es eh, Voy a referirme un poco a los pros, a los contras. No, no tengo una, una presentación, simplemente voy a exponer algunas de las ideas este, sobre que pueden dar algunos um, eh, elementos. Obviamente, eh, desde la perspectiva de la gastronomía, quisiera dar algunas cosas, ya que el gran tema es seguridad alimentaria. Nuestro mandato como Naciones Unidas es uh, seguridad alimentaria. Y por lo tanto, eh, queremos ver los pros y los contras para la seguridad alimentaria. ¿no? Eh, sin duda alguna, los transgénicos pueden tener algunas ventajas, es decir, aumento de productividad, reducción de costos, por eso es que son utilizados tan, tan ampliamente. Hay todo lo que tiene que ver con introducir, por ejemplo, eh, alimentos biofortificados, el caso del arroz dorado, hay varios ejemplos de, de eh, cultivos que han, eh, les han uh, insertado eh, genes de otras especies, genes de otro tipo dentro de su genoma, por eso se llaman genéticamente modificados, ¿no es cierto? Eh, y por lo tanto dan ciertas ventajas desde el punto de vista nutricional, ¿no? Pero por el otro lado, eh, sin duda alguna, hay temas de salud que son cuestionados, hay temas de alergias, temas de inocuidad, hay quienes aseguran de que pueda estar a, a, causando ciertas a, a alteraciones, sobre todo de tipo digestiva, ¿no? eh, como, como el caso de las alergias. ¿no? Y por lo tanto, eh, ese miedo a lo desconocido o a lo que pudiese estar generando en términos de implicaciones para la salud, Hace pues de que muchos países sean cautelosos y dicen, bueno, pueden tener ciertas ventajas, pero eh, mientras no estemos absolutamente seguros que no va a tener implicaciones para la salud, eh, no los vamos a adoptar. ¿no? Entonces hay estas posiciones y hay, y hay otras uh, también que son más de tipo práctico, como es el tema de las patentes, ¿no? eh, las empresas que desarrollan estos transgénicos, eh, OMGs, eh, son, son sinónimos, uh, de alguna manera eh, protegen su propiedad intelectual con, con patentes y para las cuales también hay que pagar un royalty anualmente quienes utilizan esa semilla. ¿no? Esto tiene implicaciones para la agricultura familiar muchas veces porque eh, hay, hay veces no solo es el tema del repago anual de, de estos royalties, sino también hay el tema de que eh, se restringe el, el tema de la biodiversidad, se restringe el tema de la cantidad de cultivos que pueden estar utilizando distintas variedades ¿no? de, de un determinado cultivo y por lo tanto puede haber alguna afectación a los parientes silvestres de eh, esas especies comestibles. La alimentación del mundo hoy por hoy fundamentalmente se basa en 12 cultivos. ¿no? Es decir, hay más, pero fundamentalmente se puede decir que 90% de lo que comemos tiene que ver con 12 cultivos y 5 especies animales que son las de mayor consumo en el mundo. Ustedes ya sabrán cuáles. Este, pero esa, esos 12 cultivos tienen sus distintas variedades. Entonces, si solamente utilizamos un solo tipo de gen y de, y de variedad durante todo el tiempo, se puede estar afectando la biodiversidad de 
ese cultivo en cuanto a, 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 a sus parientes eh, silvestres. Entonces, hay un tema ahí de, de, de afectación de la biodiversidad y también es un tema de, por el cual se, se cuestiona muchas veces el uso de transgénico y sobre todo cuando se trata de cultivos con polinización abierta que pueden hacer que el polen vaya a contaminar otro tipo de cultivos que no son transgénicos y que este, no solo van a alterar esas especies, sino también pueden hasta comprometer su propia reproducción. Entonces, son algunos de los argumentos este, en contra, pero lo que sí eh, es muy importante, y nosotros como FAO estamos sosteniendo todo el tiempo, que es fundamental el poder etiquetar los productos. ¿no? Es decir, nadie puede estar con su... Y eso tiene implicaciones para la gastronomía, Inclusive ya hay países donde las propias frutas, cada una de las frutas están etiquetadas y donde dice este es un producto transgénico, este no es transgénico. Y hay una gran cantidad de solicitudes que anualmente se hay, hay empresas certificadoras si el cultivo o el producto agrícola tiene o no transgénico. Entonces estas empresas certificadoras pues garantizan de que no haya ningún nivel. Y esto ha tenido mucha discusión en el comercio internacional, porque hay veces que un país comprador que no admite transgénicos, eh, le llega el producto, han habido casos de devolución del producto, no solo porque podría estar llevando transgénicos, sino por los que le indicaba, eh, cuando hay un producto, un cultivo transgénico al lado de otro que no es, puede haber ese flujo de genes y eso se refleja en, en, en la exportación, en, en los containers de, de, de exportación que son llevados y han habido devolución, relativamente pocas, pero sí han habido devoluciones porque hay países, como digo, que tienen tolerancia cero a la importación de, de estos cultivos. Uh, ahora, también es importante notar que eh, hay ciertos uh, cultivos que ya son casi generalizados su uso transgénico, caso de la soya. Y, 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 y al hablar de soya y, y transgénico, uno no puede hablar, dejar de hablar de glifosato, el herbicida que es utilizado antes de sembrar. Y que, por supuesto, eh, eh, hay una uh, as, uh, polémica sobre si es cancerígeno o no es cancerígeno. ¿no? El, el, el uso, y cómo eso se transmite al cultivo y de qué manera el cultivo puede contener y ahí los científicos no están de acuerdo. Hay, hay científicos que sí dicen de que podría estar conteniendo trazas de glifosato, hay otros que dicen que absolutamente no tiene y que no hay de qué preocuparse ¿no? con, con, con la presencia de glifosato en la soya. Pero el hecho es de que hoy en día toda la soya de Estados Unidos, toda la soya de Argentina, la mayor parte de la soya de Brasil es transgénica. No, no así con el trigo. El trigo sigue siendo uno de los cultivos donde no ha habido mayor modificación genética, eh, a nivel de experimentación, sí, a nivel de investigación, sí, sí los hay. Hay trigo resistente a sequía, hay trigo resistente a enfermedades, pero no está generalizado a nivel comercial, ¿no? Pero maíz sí, maíz es un cultivo que está altamente este, trabajado genéticamente con modificación genética. Y así, algodón también, es casi todo el, el algodón que se tiene. Pero al hablar de algodón, y al hablar de trigo estamos hablando de dos cosas distintas, o de papa, ¿no? en Perú, gran productor de papa y consumidor de papa. Este, no es lo mismo porque el, el, el algodón transgénico pues, es una ropa, es una vestimenta y, y que a, ahí no se ha probado que pueda haber ninguna alergia de usar una camisa con algodón transgénico. Pero sí, cuando uno ya consume la papa, que es un consumo directamente, o peor, cuando uno consume... Por ejemplo, el tomate, que es un cultivo que se consume directamente de, de, de la planta, se puede decir, sin que tenga mayor transformación. Claro, hay ketchup, hay salsas de tomate, pero cuando el tomate en ensalada se consume directamente sin ningún proceso de por medio. El caso de la soya, por lo general, es para, para aceite, y lo que consumimos es el aceite. Y ahí hay discusión si, si se puede eh, percibir o, o, o el aceite ya transformado tiene implicaciones para la salud si tiene un elemento transgénico. Son temas que están en, en, en la propia polémica de los propios científicos. ¿no? Sin embargo, al etiquetar estos cultivos, estos productos, 
pues el consumidor está libre de escoger, el consumidor está libre de, de, de tomar su decisión. Si le parece más barato el producto transgénico, pues este, por razón económica puede adoptar, o si le parece por razones eh, eh, de convicciones no adoptarlo, pero eh, el, el consumidor tiene que estar en su derecho todo el tiempo. De un, et, además, no es un etiquetado en letra pequeña en el fondo, tiene que ser un etiquetado muy claro, muy visible, muy frontal, que todo el mundo pueda percibir que el producto es agénico y, y el consumidor estar en, en la opción de poder este, hacerlo. ¿no? Entonces, eh, lo que sí estamos viendo, y esto es algo que es una gran necesidad, es el tema normativo. Creo que estamos quedándonos muy cortos en el tema de la normativa sobre transgénico. Son muy raros los países que han trabajado a cabalidad el cómo eh, eh, normar, el reglamentar. Yo soy boliviano, en el caso de Bolivia tenemos una ley muy ambigua, muy corta, sin reglamentación, no hace, en más de 10 años, que, 20 años que fue emitida esta ley, no ha sido reglamentada. Entonces hay muchos eventos que no están debidamente considerados, qué pasa con las importaciones y así. Hay una carencia muy grande de, de legislación en la mayoría de los países para no hablar a nivel internacional. Es decir, yo les mencionaba el tema de la OMC, el tema del Códex Alimentarios, eh, donde hay, hay vacíos muy grandes por, por, por esa polarización que hay en cuanto a, a tomadas muy duras en contra o a favor de de estos transgénicos, pero sí se hace evidente que eh, tanto los legisladores, parlamentarios, gobiernos, ministerios de agricultura, deben trabajar mucho más para eh, eh, normar de una manera de que eh, refleje las voluntades de, de los uh, distintos este, países. Voy a referirme al tema de la biofortificación. Sin duda alguna, los transgénicos permiten, o sea, la transferencia de genes, permiten el mejorar la calidad nutricional de, de, de muchos cultivos, ¿no? uh, in, este, insertar proteínas, hierro, hay, hay trigo con hierro, existe una variedad transgénica de trigo con mayor contenido de hierro, que es un nutriente fundamental para la salud, y así se puede trabajar y... Y, y podría este, dar importantes aportes a, a los temas de, de nutrición. Pero como digo, sin embargo, hay, hay esta reticencia por las implicaciones que eh, muchos dicen que se necesita todavía trabajar más eh, la fase de pruebas, de experimentación, para realmente estar totalmente convencidos de que no puedan tener implicaciones para, para la salud, ¿no? Este, entonces, el trigo para celíacos se ha desarrollado, hay, hay, hay un trigo libre de gluten y así. Entonces, hay opciones, hay uh, desarrollos, ¿no? Entonces, la idea es poder tener esa visión amplia, esa visión totalmente basada en ciencia, ¿no? Eh, porque sin duda alguna es un tema ideologizado, es un tema donde muchas veces se adoptan posiciones, este desde un punto de vista ideológico, ecologista extremo, o también, por el otro lado, de permisibilidad, de decir, no, no se preocupen, coman, este, y, y, y donde solo la rentabilidad es lo único que podría estar importando. Entonces, la idea es eh, tratar de poner el tema un poco más en, en, en el centro, tratar de poner el tema dentro de una discusión científica sobre las implicaciones que tiene, los beneficios, los no beneficios. Si uno mira hacia el futuro, ¿qué va a pasar con, con los transgénicos? Pues lo que se ve es un crecimiento y ha, ha venido dándose un crecimiento, pero también la resistencia cada vez también crece. ¿no? O sea, es difícil prever exactamente el, el, el futuro de los transgénicos. Lo que sí se puede decir es que hay una tendencia a que mayor cantidad de cultivos sean modificados genéticamente y lo que sí hay una tendencia a, a el aumento de áreas con, 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 con transgénicos. ¿no? Y ahí está el rol de, de las transnacionales, ahí está el rol de estas grandes empresas que normalmente detentan las, las patentes, eh, son a, a grandes intereses que están a, 
de por medio para poder eh, influenciar en, en una o en otra dirección. ¿no? Pero para concluir, después podemos recibir algunas preguntas. Yo insistiría mucho en la necesidad de obviamente continuar las investigaciones sobre ese tema y sobre todo el tema de la regulación, trabajar mucho más la regulación porque estamos muy cortos de, de regulación. Muchas gracias y, y quedo atento a las preguntas una vez escuchamos a Angélica. ¿eh? Muchísimas gracias. Eh, creo que hemos podido abordar muchos pros, muchos contras. Es, eh, todavía creo que la ciencia va más rápido que la normativa, creo que eso es en todos los campos. Y tenemos bastante por hacer. Aquí la academia cumple un rol fundamental para acercar el conocimiento a eh, la sociedad y a los, a los que toman decisiones en temas normativos y de regulaciones. Y vamos a dar paso a Angélica Hilbeck. Angélica Hilbeck es investigadora senior en el Instituto de Biología Integrativa ETH de Zurich, Suiza, una organización enfocada en la sostenibilidad y presidenta saliente de la Red Europea de Científicos por la Responsabilidad Social y Ambiental, un grupo anti-OGM fundado por el biólogo francés Gilles Eric Seralin y otros científicos y defensores activistas. Ayudó a organizar la preparación de una declaración publicada en la incisiva revista abierta de pago Ciencias Ambientales Europa en enero del 2015 y fue coautora con la filósofa india Bandana Shiva del reporte del consumidor de Michael Hansen y otros científicos activistas asegurando que no hay consenso científico acerca de la seguridad de los OGM. Bienvenida, Angélica. Eh, el espacio es todo tuyo. Thank you very much. Do you all hear me? Yes, good. Thank you. Um, I will never get used to this kind of presentation mode, uh, regardless how often I do it. I do miss people in the room and looking in their faces and seeing reactions. So um, I'm sorry I can't be in the room. Thank you very much for inviting me um, to this interesting event. And we have encountered a few technical glitches already meaning I will have to say next all the time when I need another slide because I couldn't share my, my screen with you. So somebody else kindly volunteered to advance my slides as I speak. Um, you will get from me now uh, a pretty, probably a pretty European view on, on these uh, things. Um, I am in a continent that has been skeptical uh, about it. I, my background, to, to declare that as well, is as an agricultural ecologist. I am in this field, um, in particular, participating in the field of uh, GMOs since almost 30 years now, so I have grown old over this issue. And I've seen and been in the different contexts. I have part of my education took place in the United States. Um, my first degree, uh, I, the master's in agriculture ecology, I got in Germany from a university in Germany near Stuttgart. And I then moved from the United States to Switzerland and have been living and uh, researching and teaching here at uh, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology since more than 20 years now. And mainly in this field, but I'm moving since the last 10 years also more towards agroecology. I cannot cover it today now because it's, this field has become, is very polarized as the speaker before me has been saying, but we've also moved on now to say, what else can we offer or what other systems are available that can produce healthy food very productively without destroying and degrading our environment, which has suffered a lot under the industrial model of, of agriculture. And that is being increasingly recognized now. And certainly in Europe, we're, we're now seeing policies being implemented that are aiming to head towards a more environmentally um, or ecological kind of agriculture. Um, next slide, please. So speaking about 30 years, can I have the next slide? Thank you. Um, 
even the whole technology started even earlier than that. So while my horizon is 30 years since the early 90s or pretty much 1990s specifically, the whole issue of genetic engineering started in the mid 90s when the first tools to transfer, cut out DNA and transfer it into other unrelated organisms were discovered in the early 70s. And immediately from that discovery on, it was associated with um, very bold and very um, brave promises. And it's been, you know, terms like you see here in this book uh, by Susan Wright, who published it in 1994 already, only covering the first 10 years, basically. It was already about politics and about business models that were behind it. And some of the early inventors and discoverers of these tools were dived, dove immediately into the business concepts as well. And they were making bold promises saying, we revolutionize pharmaceutical industry and we will meet uh, some of the most fundamental needs of both medicine and agriculture, etc." So the sky was the limit, the promises were big. Next slide, please. And no less than, can you? Yes, then ending world hunger was a promise even until the year 2000 made by no lesser than the Nobel Prize laureate for peace of 1970, Norman Borlaug. So in Europe, we've always been skeptically following whether or not those promises have been met. And if yes, um, what the price tag was that came along with it because it was clear, it was right from the get-go, primarily a business model, and there were the big corporations who were jumping into it right from the get-go. Next, please. Can you please advance? Okay. So this is just a slide, as I, as I like to show from those days and ages. This is pre, I mean, just the beginning of computers, pre-internet, pre-smartphones, pre-cameras. So it's difficult to get you know, evidence or proof of, of all the bold promises and the trajectories you were getting in those days. So this is a slide from no lesser than the chief technical or science officer of Monsanto company in the mid nineties, but I've seen these earlier than that, where the promises were made to deliver agronomic trades just within the next five years, basically until the year 2000, they should be gone and we would be mainly dealing with plants that had traits from that were good for food processing followed by traits that were good or could be worked with in pharmaceutical cosmeceutical nutraceuticals you know those were all the vitamin and iron 45 plants etc or specialty chemical uh, were going to be the new products that were on the horizon and these were promises so not small change not maybe you know maybe let's see if it works we'll try but that's what we did on. next slide please so now 30 years have gone uh, almost uh, in our past and it's it's about time or we're kind of looking back and it's like so what happened uh, what has materialized and if it hasn't materialized why is that so what has materialized in terms of what's commercially available globally, 99% of all GM crops, crops grown commercially have two types of traits. One is the herbicide tolerance trait, mostly vast majority still round up glyphosate based uh, herbicides. And the other type of trait is insect resistance, all of which are based on traits that were taken from Bacillus stringensis. Um, could you advance, please? So I'm going to speak briefly about, so, so the selection is, is limited, okay? Those are 99% of all the crops. We're dealing since the day one when they started growing them in 1996 to this day, 25 years later. And Bacillus stringensis, next one, I'm very sorry, I have to say like next, next now because they were meant to come in sequence. <laughs> um, the Bacillus thuringiensis is the donor organism for a whole array of bacterial toxins that were taken next out of these slides, uh, out of these uh, bacteria, using different, you know, transgenic technologies and going into maize in this case, but the same traits or constructs were also put into cotton, as uh, the speaker before mentioned it, into soybean and or into uh, oilseed rape. 
So the Bt maze now, the maze that contains this transgene, is producing a microbial insecticidal toxin in every cell of its plant all the time from germination throughout the harvest. So you find it in the roots, you find it in the pollen, you find it in the kernels, and you find it in all plant parts that you're harvesting and feeding to animals, for example. And the aim was to have high concentrations of these toxins. Next, please. So what it does, or what, what the goal was, uh, is having it now persistently expressed in every plant part that any uh, specific pests that are susceptible to this protein could feed on any part of the plant, would ingest the toxin, and would get a serious stomach ache and die of it, so that the plant could defend itself against its herbivores that are feeding on it. Next one, please. Next. Okay. Next one, you can skip that. With herbicide tolerant plants, so Bt plants are expressing a insecticidal protein in the plant. With the next category of plants, the herbicide tolerant plants, you have another one, just hang on. You are also, the trait was taken from a bacterium, from Agrobacterium to Mephastians, in this for Roundup, for glyphosate-based herbicides, and is replacing the plant, the native enzyme in the plants that are blocked by glyphosate herbicides. And so every plant, most plants have this. So all plant native enzymes are blocked and the plants are dying, except for the herbicide tolerant ones who have gotten a substitute enzyme that is not being blocked by glyphosate and continue to produce amino acids that are necessary for, for the growth. So what you can do here with these plants is you can spray them once or repeatedly with Roundup or glyphosate-based uh, alternative herbicides and the plant will not die from it. It will grow, but everything else that is green, basically, all other plants that are there will die. So you give your plant a, so that's a weed control, a very efficient weed control. Next one, please. So the idea was mainly that you can now spray a weed killer, a broad spectrum weed killer on a standing crop which was impossible before. You would kill your own plant. And you could do so very efficiently by, for example, in these industrial systems by using airplanes, which was kind of impossible that you could do at a later point of time. Next one, please. So those are primarily the two traits. The innovation we're seeing since about the mid 2000s, 2005, seven on, is that these two traits are being combined. And the reason why that is because we, that was just about the time when we started to see resistance issues coming up against these various, uh, against these types of traits. So they had to start to stack different types of Bt toxins and um, different uh, herbicides in, in plants. What you can do now, next one, please is you can, you have plants today, mainly you have GM crops out there that are producing Bt toxins, usually multiple, and you can spray them with herbicides. So for people with an ecological mind or people also with concerns for food safety, this is of course all news or worrying news where you require or, or are like wondering, um, all of these products of course leave residues or are an integral component, as in case of Bt maize, are an integral component of the plant. And so food safety issues were an issue that came up right at the beginning, what these residues of herbicides will do, how high they will be, how frequent they will be, and also the residues of the Bt toxins. And of course, when you grow both in combination, will they interact or will this potpourri of different chemicals in addition to all other chemicals that are being sprayed, like fungicides, seed treatments, for example, neonicotinoids, etc., that are all part and parcel of an industrial production system. And how would they possibly interact uh, in terms of not only for human health, but also for the environment and the food chain 
that you see and the, the communities of insects and, and mammal and wildlife that feeds on or is part of the food chain and the food web uh, in nature. Next image, please. Next one. So these two trade types of trades are being combined and it's the same, the same types of cassettes and constructs that have been put into basically four commodity crops. These four commodity crops with these two trades, two types of trades make up 99% of all commercial GM crops grown since 20 years. These two commodity crops are crops that are raw, produce raw material for industrial um, production chains. Some end in food, most end in feed. So most of them are being fed to animals and a lot of them and an increasing number of them have been feeding our engines because they were used for producing ethanol and plant-based fuels or fiber in the case of, of BT cotton or of cotton, GM cotton. So soybean is the biggest one, maize follows cotton and then uh, some uh, canola or oilseed rape as you use it. So from the get-go, and this is not, not surprising, from the get-go, the driving industry behind it was the chemical industry that became then biotech industries. The, you know, all know the company names, now Bayer, uh, by BASF, uh, Monsanto being part of Bayer now these days. Novartis, Syngenta, etc. They are all the ones who were behind it, um, developing this business model. And of course, they are chemical companies, so they are into selling chemicals. And they created very clever business concepts where these GMOs became the platforms of delivery for their products, either internally or externally applied or on seeds applied. Next slide, please. And this was, of course, uh, a concern that, that was raised, you know, in Europe, this didn't go down very well. So a consequence of now the different um, situations as countries have reacted, as the speaker before me has correctly pointed out, there have been lots of debates, uh, which countries are going to accept them for production, for cultivation, which, which countries are only going to accept them for food and feed uh, as commodities. So it turns out to this day now that 87 or close to 90, actually it's 90% of all the GM crops are actually grown in North and South America. So the rest 10% is in, in some in Asia and Australia, a little bit in, in, South, uh, in, in Africa and in Southern Africa only. But the big bulk of it uh, is grown on these two half continents, North and South America because it's, it, it's understandable why that is, because it's these two continents where we see the most biggest and most industrialized integrated systems we have on planet Earth, basically. The largest industrial systems, like the image taken here is an image from, from Brazil, I believe. This is the kind of agriculture, we, we don't have that in Europe and you will be hard pressed to find these kinds of systems somewhere else. Next slide, please. And that is what these crops have been um, developed for. It was exactly these industrial systems. That's where the market was. That's where the profits were. So Europe looks a bit like this. And in essence, it means everything green. The countries have uh, utilized what we call an opt-out option. They have informed Brussels, our European uh, capital of the EU, that they wish not to cultivate uh, GM crops. And there is in fact in all of Europe. So my, my country is a little one here in the middle, the Switzerland where I live now. We're not part of the EU, but we have a moratorium since 2005 on the production and to a large extent also on the import of GM, GM crops. There is only one crop approved for cultivation in the field. That's the good old Monet 10 BT maize, the first one of the first ones it's meanwhile 25 years old and hardly anybody grows it anymore the only two countries where you still find some level of cultivation is spain and to a much lesser degree portugal as well spain grows round about 120,000 
hectares and it's all for consumption of feed uh, of their animals in Spain. So this is not for any global markets or anything. This is just for feed of Spanish um, cattle. Next slide, please. So from these promises, if you go back and look, okay, what was promised where we would be today, notably 2020, which is off the scale here even. Next slide, please. We must say we have never really um, left the agronomic trade because that's what they were. The BT trade, the insecticidal trade, protecting the plants against certain pests and the herbicide trade, allowing a more efficient and uh, more economic um, wheat control at the vast scales. So for smaller farmers, you know, only working on 10 or 20 hectares, like the average size of a farm in Switzerland where I live is 20 hectares. So it doesn't make any sense to grow a herbicide tolerant plant there because, um, you know, this, this only makes economic sense if you have large, large fields where you can, where you actually see an economic benefit on it. So none of these plants were really attractive to most uh, European countries. Next slide, please. And that explains why we don't really grow them. However, we do import them. So that has been a bit of the deal between uh, the production part of the world, which is North and South America, and Europe, which said we're not gonna grow it, but we do import it for our industrial animal factory animal production so that is we are not gm free in that sense we just don't grow them except for spain but we do import them for our cattle for the food much less in my country there is no gm food uh, it's not imported and processed here and also in the rest of europe it is uh, difficult because we have very strict labeling laws and the consumers in all countries have always signaled said they don't want it and the retailers and food processors have not experimented with that and are following what the consumers are telling them. So it is difficult, you basically don't find um, foods that are labeled with, um, that they contain GM parts or GM products. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the rest, um, all the other crops you, you do here, like the vitamin crops or fortify crops or virus resistant crops, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, you can just add on. Um, are make up our niche products, essentially. They, they divide the remaining 1% amongst them. So most of them are grown in the United States. They have some, and, and they are also either herbicide tolerant or contain the BT. So this is uh, sugar beets that are herbicide tolerant, alfalfa that's herbicide tolerant, or BT potatoes. And then there's ap papaya is a virus resistant papaya and squash as well. And then there's non-browning apples and non-browning potatoes, for example. So you see the list, this is the most recent one I could find on an industry website that follows um, the production and the numbers globally. We don't have otherwise a global monitoring um, institution that follows um, what's being produced and, and who grows it, etc. So 1% makes up the rest of it. There is no vitamin A, so there's no golden rice out there, there's no iron fortified uh, crops out there and none of that. Next slide, please. In the commercial field. But it's not for not trying, but maybe we can go into this uh, in the discussion. They tried a lot. They've been huge amounts of, of uh, trials and these plants all do exist, but they never made the cut to the marketplace. They never got out in the field. Now coming risk and damage. We're, they are growing, you are growing in, not you Peru, but in North and South Amer America are growing these plants on a vast scale since roughly 20, a little more maybe, of 25 years. Now let's move to what we're observing, what's going on in these countries. So there's a whole list of things I could talk about. I am focusing on, next slide please, it's just gonna highlight. I'm going to talk about the non-target, some a little bit about non-target organisms and ecological functions and spend a little more time on the resistance evolution. All of these, I shall add, all of these potential risks that now have manifested, they're not risks anymore, so they're actually 
damage and harm that has manifested itself. All of them have been listed right from the beginning as potential risks and hazards that should have been taken care of right from the beginning. So I was there, I was part of those scientists who raised these issues in the mid 90s or even before that this is something that will be coming and we will be facing. And we were trying to convince regulators, trying to convince the authorities to take care of them beforehand. In Europe, the solution was we're not gonna grow them and in America, they didn't listen. So next one. So what we're seeing now are the lessons learned for us and what, what, what always reconfirmed for the European regulators also that we don't need them is that some of these risks or these risks became more or less uh, reality and which didn't make it more attractive for European production systems. Next slide, please. So I'll speak a little bit about some non-target effects, which could be secondary pests, pest replacement, etc. There's a nice case example that illustrates what we mean. Next slide, please. So we had, for example, next slide. Okay, we have, if you grow BT crops that express a, a potent insecticidal compound for months on end in every plant part and in all kinds of crops, soybean following cotton, following maize, following whatever, that contains the same genes or same proteins, you will see a shift in the kind of pest complex in these fields. So the target pests that are susceptible will die, of course, until they are resistant. But before that, they will die to the larger extent. But other pests that are there that are not susceptible will move in. And that is what we call secondary pests. They kind of move in and if they stay there, they will become the next primary pest, which we then call a replacement. These are well-known processes for every agroecologist or every biocontrol person knows this. This is basically biocontrol 101 when you start in the field. And there were early warnings where they observed a particular pest, and it was from the target pest family even, the Lepidoptera, the moths, in the mid-2000s already, where an, an insect pest that had never been on the radar really as a pest. Not every herbivore is a pest. It only becomes a pest or declared pest by humans when it reaches a certain threshold where it interferes with the yield. Anything below is not a pest, it's just a herbivore that's out there, and it's actually part of our biodiversity that we don't necessarily want to eliminate. So this critter was always part of the biodiversity out there. It hardly caused any, any problems, certainly not in maize. By 2006, once, you know, in the year 10 of BT crop production, scientists noted that this insect is moving in and is becoming more and more. And they sent the first paper published by these uh, uh, folks were kind of warning that there is a potential pest specifically on the transgenic crop, funnily. There was still some other non BT crops grown and it wasn't a problem there. It seemed to like, for unknown reasons, it seemed to thrive on transgenic BT crops. So they said, we need to investigate other emerging or potential arthropod pests on transgenic corn if we don't want to run on that dreadmo into, into the next problem. Next slide, please. Of course, nobody listens, and there is very little room to listen in that kind of a system that, you know, the industrial system. By 2010, it was funnily a, a Greenpeace report in, in Germany issued and said, look, actually what you're seeing there is exactly what we've been warning you, and that that pest has now reached a pest replacement level. Of course, some uh, US uh, scientists were sort of denying it. They were not denying that it's there, but they were denying that this is a BT problem. They were denying that this is a problem with the GM crop. They said, oh, this is what always happens in fields. You know, you have some pests come, others go, and this is just up to the farmer to deal with this issue. Next slide, please. Next slide. So this is, shows you a little bit the movement until in the gray area, this insect was known for decades. It didn't cause any, any problems. 
And then from 2000 on, it started to move east very fast and became a problem. And now I just looked it up now in preparation of this, this uh, um, talk. It is now a common known primary pest on maize that requires additional treatment to protect your crop. So the original one is gone or is still kind of kept at bay, which is the European corn borer, but it has been replaced by what became first a secondary pest and then a primary pest. Next slide. So, you know, is this success or not? Yes, you kept the original first, first uh, um, pest kind of at bay, but you bought yourself another one. So we also had reports, and that is very difficult to say in the field, but we had, um, next slide please, regarding beneficial insects. Myself, this was my primary field of research. We studied the effects of BT toxins on so-called non-target beneficial insects, predatory species that are part of the, the, the control community out there that keeps herbivores at bay or makes sure that herbivores are not becoming pests if you let them. But of course, pesticide, we know that pesticide applications have been disrupting these dynamics and have been also affecting these beneficial organisms so that these checks and balances got out of balance and certain pests uh, became, uh, had an advantage and rose to a pest level. So now the issue was what we tried to find out if Bt toxins have similar unpredictable effects that might further add to the imbalance that synthetic pesticides have already created and might add and undermine the biocontrol function that these organisms have. So these are just some reports, I cannot go into detail there, um, of peer-reviewed publications that do report significant and diverse, unpredictable adverse effects that all were ignored in the original risk assessments, even in the risk assessments that the Europeans did. Next slide, please. Next slide. But what had really become a huge problem to this day now, and what is for many people really concerning is the resistance issue. Another risk that was recognized right from the get-go, it is clear if you have a persistent insecticide, hang on, if you have a persistent insecticide out there for months in all kinds of crops, for years and decades, you will have resistance evolving. For the BT crop, this was actually an issue that was taken up by the regulator. The US regulator, the EPA, did accept this as a risk uh, issue and did issue conditional approvals only for BT crops, making mandatory certain IRM uh, concepts, insect resistant management plans, that the companies had to make sure to enforce, that the farmers were following. So there was a huge amount of uh, research going in there. They came up with clever plans and they actually did delay resistance where they were followed, where they were not followed. You did see resistance coming in very quickly. I personally followed that issue in South Africa where they didn't follow that. And within a few years already, less than five years, there were the first reports of resistance issues in the target pest species arising. However, now about 25 years have gone by and even the best IRM, the best resistant management plan, cannot delay resistance forever. In particular, when in some areas people are not following the strict rules. Um, and so this is now the situation I just got um, this, this most recent publication stemming from 2017, a review publication that gave the recent best numbers right now. So we have about 14 or 16 um, species, target pest species that are resistant against a whole array of uh, Bt toxins. And you can see that this is correlated to the production uh, number as the production area did increase over the years. We, globally, we saw an increase in resistance evolution in the target pests. And this was sometimes despite, uh, or even when you had IRM management plans in place. Next slide, please. So, next slide. What was the industry solution? And I showed you that the innovation that came in and then around the mid 
2000s. This is when these resistance issues arose. The first mem uh, um, reports were from field resistance did surface. So what the industry did then in order to prolong its, its products is it started to combine the different types of toxins. They're all from BT, they're all slightly different. Some of them target the same pests, but have slightly different mode of action. So they will start doing the stacks, what they call, they combine them. And there's this corn smart stacks, that's the largest stack of having combined six BT toxins. What they did is they were buying time. Next slide. However, just today, next slide please, came this message in um, that the time seems to be up even in the United States now where they still followed fairly well um, the insect resistant management plans, but 25 years down the road, that's how far you could bring it. Now the problem has risen to the point where the ETA is now starting to propose that we have to take or they have to take a whole range of BT hybrids, BT varieties off the market. A national phase-out plan has been suggested and there is actually only one type of BT protein left over where there is no documented insect resistance there yet. That's the VIP3A protein for all other traits, including the six in the smart sex. There are reports about resistance and some of the species are resistant to a whole range of it. So I don't know what's going to happen less. This is, as you see with the date, this is a publication yesterday. We're, that's that's an, ongoing, um, an ongoing story right now. Next slide. Next slide. It's worse, much worse even with the resistance to herbicides because here the regulator did not insist on having management plans in place although we all knew, everybody knew that it can happen. So there was no management uh, set in place. There was a, a almost exclusive focus on Roundup ready crops. Monsanto captured the market fully and wholly so that this trade, the glyphosate based um, herbicide resistance is in, in every crop, in all of the uh, four commodity crops and a few others. And so Roundup became a integral component of every industrial system in the United States for decades now. And you can see here, this is, I just downloaded it yesterday from uh, a website that keeps an international survey that follows these resistance evolutions. And we are now up to a total of 50 species that have, that are, cannot be controlled anymore. with gly uh, glyphosate based uh, herbicides. Next slide, please. And this has put the farmer since many years in front of a very bad situation. Um, it's been an issue of regulatory uh, concern uh, in the United States since many years now. Farmers are growing desperate because they cannot handle these massive weeds anymore. Next one. So the super weed uh, scenario, next one please, has come reality. Um, they're losing the battle. So next slide. What the industry came up here with is that in addition to smart stacks now with six BT toxins, they added two traits of broad spectrum herbicides, one being still Roundup, which is less and less effective, and the other being in this case glyphosate, glufosinate. You also have combinations with Dicamba, and with 2,4-D and Dicamba in like a combination of three. So what the farmers are being told these days now is they are combining all of these pretty nasty herbicides in one tank mix. Excuse me. Um, yeah. In one tank mix and spraying what they can in order to keep their herb uh, uh, weeds at bay. All of this, of course, has massive implications for the residues because you find these residues in the crops that you harvest, in the soybean and in the maize kernels. And there it goes into the feed chain and it goes into the food chain. Next slide. And we know, of course, the resistant dread mill is keep, keeping going because against the Dicamba and 2,4-D, we also have around uh, 45 uh, uh, reported resistant beads already. Now you have to tell me um, whether this, I could stop it now if you want to deal with the 
um, older, uh, all the kinds of GM crops that are out there right now, we can start a discussion. But I could go on, I have a few more slides on the new genetic engineering techniques that are being praised as now the ones who can achieve what the other ones haven't done. But if you find the time is up, then I can stop here. This would be a moment to stop. Please advise me. Hi, Angelica, we have uh, some questions already. Uh, if I don't hear you. If, if, if the rest of your presentation is short, we can go ahead. <laughs> we have a, a lot of questions. Maybe we can start uh, with a um, question. Then, uh, can somebody give me audio? Uh, yes, okay. now I hear you. Okay. Perfecto. Eh, voy a empezar con una pregunta que es más conceptual y que creo que puede también eh, ampliar el panorama. Okay. Because I wasn't sure if the new techniques and the new genetic engineering uh, products that are in the pipeline are not really out yet. A few are coming out, but they're not really yet, there yet. Are of concern for Peru as well. I don't know, and that's something I'm keen to learn from you, what your GM moratorium is covering and where the limits would be. Yeah. Because I, I, that's what we're concerned now within Europe. They're, they're coming and trying to... Um, yeah, our can pregunta, como, como te mencioné, es una pregunta un poco más entre un organismo genéticamente modificado y un transgénico, que creo que es importante tenerlo claro. Okay, GMOs are genetically modified organisms. That's uh, the laws. Uh, that's the term in the legal in the legal frame mm -hmm. but gmos transgenics is just a type of te technology what they what it, it's the same it means that genes have been transferred from a organism a that is not related to organism b mm -hmm. so okay. you trans gene okay Perfect. that's there is but the product then is called genetically modified in the in the u.s you call them traded because they want to avoid the term gmo uh, yeah. or they're called G genetic engineered geo so there's different different terms for it but it's it's the same it's it's organisms that are being genetically modified with various uh, techniques perfecto entonces tenemos a los organismos eh, que han, cuyos genes han sido manipulados Y dentro de esos hay eh, aquellos que se les han insertado genes de otras especies que son los transgénicos. Lo que me lleva a la siguiente pregunta. Eh, ¿Hasta qué grado se puede modificar a un organismo? Y, y si hay alguien que regula esto. Acá también, por favor, este, eh, eh, si tenemos eh, algunos ejemplos de la OMS sobre diversas entidades regulatorias. ¿no? Uh -huh. okay. So there is various, yes, it's, it, it depends where you live, where it's regulated. So in, in all kind of, um, for the production, the release into the environment, there is a international law called the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. That's under the UN. So the gentleman um, before me spoke about the Codex Alimentarius, that's for food regulation under the FAO, also UN organization. And under the UNEP or the UN Organization for Environment, you have the Cartagena Protocol. Actually, it's coming out of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And that relates to laws and regulations that uh, regulate the release into the environment, namely requires that you do a, before you release and approve an organism, a GMO into the environment, you have to do a environmental risk assessment. And that's all written in the law, you know, the, 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 the big um, protection goals are stipulated in these laws, etc. I believe Peru is a signatory to it. So you do have, and as soon as you ratify it, I believe Peru has done both, but you can correct me on that, please, please check. If you do that, it is law for you. Mm -hmm. And you are required to make this, uh, bring this into domestic and national law. And I would think that you've done that, but I'm not sure about Peru. I didn't check. 
Ahorita, justo en este momento, estamos en un proceso de análisis para ver si se extiende la moratoria a los eh, organismos genéticamente modificados. Por eso es tan importante el debate. Eh, eh, a nivel nacional... So you have to check if you have ratified it, if you are signatory to it, and if your government has put this into domestic law at this point. If they ratified it, they must put it into domestic law. No sé si Alan tenga algún comentario en relación a entidades regulatorias. Maybe he knows. Sí, sí, este, bueno, muy, muy importante lo del protocolo de, de Cartagena. Como muy bien lo dice Angélica, eh, cuando se ratifica, se ratifica por una ley, ¿no? Entonces pasa a ser parte de la legislación nacional y ahí se, se establece eso. Pero obviamente eh, este, no siempre se le da cumplimiento. Hay países que le dan cumplimiento y que son más observadores de, del protocolo que otros, ¿no? Es decir, ahí hay, 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 cada uno interpreta más o menos, a, a, pero en estricto censo debería ser una ley de, 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 del país, ¿no? Eh, pero lo que yo les decía... So, would you know, um, Alan, would you know whether Peru, Peru has ratified it, right? So, no, Peru no, no, is a signatory no, 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 to, to debería, yo creo que sí. Es altamente probable, pero no tengo la, 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 la seguridad, ¿no? Este, no yo, el, yo estoy el, en Colombia ahora. The only countries that have not definitely not ratified it is the United States, which is a problem. Argentina, Canada, and maybe a couple. So most countries, 180 plus, 186, seven countries have ratified it. And it is, so it's the law in these countries. But you need to put it, you need to harmonize it with your domestic law. So... And where you stand in Peru with that, that I don't know. Precisamente estos son los espacios que nos permiten analizar si extendemos la moratoria o no para ratificar o no la prohibición. Yes. Yo que, quería mencionar que han habido un par de consultas eh, donde se expresa el interés en relación a los organismos genéticamente modificados para semillas fortificadas, o sea, con, con características nutricionales. Eh, que han preguntado si pudieran explicar un poquito más del tema y particularmente eh, de, de, que se desprende de la, de la exposición de Angélica la dificultad que han tenido de estas promesas llegar al mercado. Eh, preguntaríamos si, a, si estos impedimentos vienen por un lado okay. de, well, no, sir. de mm -hmm. financiamiento, de la industria per se, por dónde está el, el, el problema de que esas promesas nutricionales lleguen al mercado. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, you will get different answers to that. <laughs> so depending, um, you know, on your point of view. So my point of view uh, is that, that if I, I'm following um, the golden rice issue since decades, okay, because they were developed originally, the first vitamin A rice was developed by a colleague of mine at my institution, You're actually next door in the building. So that's been, of course, a, a, a issue that we always hotly debated and was always discussed and we're following. To this day, there is no functioning, they are not on the market because they, they, they couldn't get properly expressing genes, um, products out there. Um, they, you know, It's one thing to develop a line. It's one thing to develop uh, some plants that work in a closed environment, that work in a um, small field trial, but getting those, those traits reliably, sufficiently expressed in a whole range of different varieties that are acceptable to farmers, and they were targeting small farmers in India, in the Philippines, etc., that work there under their, the real world circumstances is much more difficult than genetic engineers are willing to accept. And it is my position, if I follow that, because I've, they've tried it a lot, they, they failed in many instances, they had trouble either it was disrupting other types of processes, metabolic processes in the, in the plant. There were uh, publications about this where they explained, you know, in some of the varieties why or what possible metabolic uh, trait was disrupted. Um, 
it was difficult to get it into the farmers right farmers don't grow hybrid varieties they grow their own recycled seeds there was a lot of debate well if you want to make a difference with that you have to have it in all of those traits but people didn't want to have transgenics into their traditional um, land raised varieties into their many many different types of rice types that are grown for many different reasons so it's been an ongoing political issue on that side as well but technically just technically there is no functioning plan yet that could be ready for market release and that would actually stand a chance to be competitive on the market you know and we see that a lot with the other varieties as well they just didn't make the cut to the market the companies who are behind it are not going to explain you why they not went forward to this so you are of course you have to interpret it yourself and see how far did they get it and when did they pull it from the market of well, most of the things you never hear anything of you know you just see in the field release trials you can follow what's being tested in the field da, da, da. but then it just disappears it never comes into the market into the pipeline and it's up to the developer why they're not putting them forward you know it's a fact that in the United States and in Latin America or in Canada, they have no, they have completely different rules. So it's, it's not that the regulatory hurdles would be high. They could have released anything they wanted to, but still didn't. And why they didn't is, is something that the companies need to explain. Okay. But the narrative on the other side, just to give you that as well is it's the regulations. Okay, so you will, if you talk to a genetic engineer, they, they will give you the narrative that uh, the regulations are too tough and uh, we cannot, you know, it's too many things they require us, so that's blocking us from progress. That's not true. Certainly not true for the United States where they don't have these regulations, you know, and certainly not true for Argentina and marginally true for Brazil and many other countries as well where they don't follow those kinds of rules. It's actually pretty much Europe that has the strictest regulations. So you could, China would have done what they wanted to if they had. But China has not released anything really other than BT cotton. So they are very reluctant with food crops. They've, we have, they're illegally there. We know they're there. But officially, no. So there is a lot going on and there is a complex answer to that simple but important question un poco en la misma línea no este sin duda alguna esta este debate mundial no Europa versus Estados Unidos este etcétera obviamente se traduce en los países no y y se produce en los parlamentos y, y ahí en los parlamentos este es un debate muy común y los parlamentarios por lo general no se quieren comprometer con con el tema, ¿no? Es parte por qué no se termina de regular ese tema, particularmente en América Latina, que es donde conozco mejor, ¿no? Pero también hay la, la otra, porque también hay la otra opción del mejoramiento genético convencional, donde sí hay muy buenas variedades con fito, quiero decir, con este, biofortificación, ¿no? Muy buenas. El CIA aquí en Colombia está produciendo, por ejemplo, tanto maíz como camote biofortificado con vitamina D que, que aporta la nutrición. Entonces uno dice, ¿para qué se va a complicar con todo el rollo burocrático político si uno lo puede hacer por la vía del mejoramiento convencional? Puede tener sus ventajas y desventajas como todo en la vida, pero, pero sí hay siempre esa otra opción de poder optar por una tecnología conocida que no tiene este nivel de complicaciones, ¿no? Perfecto. Eh, bueno, yo quería llegar eh, a la siguiente pregunta. I agree. I may chip in a little bit. I agree with what Ellen said that that and that has been increasingly an issue. So I must say, I, it's my perception of, of the debate that um, but there's technical problems. You have technical problems getting these things reliably expressed in all the varieties in all the environments, etc. But on top of that comes then, and that is very expensive. On top of that comes the political debate and people have become really good also in looking for the alternative. So conventional breeding has actually delivered a lot in the recent decades while we were battling the GMOs kind of under, under the current, 
you see uh, uh, quite some successes in with conventional breeding, which kind of solves your problem as well, you know. So more and more people are asking why bother if we if we can achieve it this way as well. Angelica Allen, este tema ha sido bastante interesante. Eh, creo que va a dar lugar para un foro nuevo. Eh, vamos a, a seguir con las preguntas. Eh, tenemos eh, una pregunta un poco exploratoria. ¿Qué hay de, de, hacer, eh, de diseñar transgénicos con otros fines que no sean eh, per se agrícolas o nutricionales, como podría ser la sostenibilidad ambiental, generar plantas que puedan captar mayor eh, CO2, por ejemplo, eh, o, o algunos traits que sean de otras industrias que no necesariamente sean las agrícolas o las de salud? Angélica, ladies first. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> um, they tried and they failed. That's pretty much the short, short answer. I've been following that field a long time and we've been promised uh, drought tolerant, salt tolerant, aluminum tolerant, I mean, I, the whole list of making them uh, adaptable to um, tricky environments. And technically that has not been possible because, uh, and there's an there's a, a easy explanation for that, What all of these genetic engineering techniques can do, technically, is they can manipulate single genes. So, meaning small parts of DNA that are located in, in one locus, one, one gene. All of these complex environmental traits are hundreds of traits. For drought tolerance, there, there are, there, a whole metabolism is, is involved. A organism that experiences stress due to drought usually also experiences stress due to either high temperature, very high, that causes a drought, or very low temperature, that also causes a drought. So the whole organism with its entirety of its metabolism has to change. It's not only one gene. So and getting at these what's called quantitative traits, the technology cannot do it. It's just not possible, it hasn't worked. So we have problems and, and it already stops, the buck already stops at, at fungal resistance. There is no really good working fungal resistant plants out there. There's a reason why it's BT and not much else or why it's herbicide. -tool. These were the simple traits. You could locate them on one gene that one gene codes for the production of one protein, end of story. So you needed to get that into a plant and make sure with promoters and terminators and all that it would be expressed. But already with fungal resistance, it's becoming complex. Fungi are much more difficult to combat. You can't just have one substance in there and stop the fungal growth. So already there, they are trying with multiple genes and, and are trying to simulate a quantitative trait by adding a lot of single traits but that's not how nature works you know where where it's it's really the might we're not just the sum of our parts we are different functions of the various parts and controlling those functions in the different environments is very very difficult and i think genetic engineers notoriously are underestimating that complexity and the, that genotype isn't even isn't always the same phenotype in every environment. You get a phenotype in this environment and a slightly different one in this, and it may not work at all in yet another one. So it's the complexity of life and it's, it's the entirety of the organism that makes it really, really difficult. And that's why it's technically hasn't worked. It's, mm -hmm. they're not there, they don't function. So the drought tolerant maze that Monsanto claims is drought tolerant, I have not seen a single publication that shows that. Alan, the maze is, a, is not a blockbuster. Felita, vamos a, a permitir a Alan si tiene algún comentario complementario. Sí, mira, voy a usar la misma lógica de, de mi anterior respuesta, ¿no? ¿Para qué pasar por todo este esfuerzo de, de, de trabajar en transgénicos? Tema, por ejemplo, de absorción, de, de mayor absorción de carbono, etcétera. Si se puede hacer con otras herramientas, como en el caso del carbono específicamente, por ejemplo, un impuesto... A, a, a las emisiones de, de carbono a las industrias. Se puede ser mucho más eficiente que trabajar este otro lado. 
o evitar la deforestación. O sea, hay otras políticas, hay otras herramientas que pueden causar mayor impacto y que van a tener menos complicaciones, ¿no? Tengo varias preguntas relacionadas que voy a tener, tratar de resumir en el sentido de si existe algún efecto positivo demostrado en algún país eh, sobre estos organismos genéticamente modificados. Eh, acá me hablan de poder enfocar esto en productos destinados al consumo humano. También mencionan el, eh, no solamente el tema sanitario, sino la gestión agrícola, es decir, si hay eh, eh, beneficios en el caso de los eh, agricultores, precios de semilla, etcétera, que pudieran en todo caso haber sido considerados en otros países como beneficiosos y si nos pudieran dar al, algún tipo de, de, eh, de benchmark eh, en relación a otros países que pudieran haber tomado estos caminos. Eh, okay. Esta vez, tal vez comienzo yo. Yeah, ah, ah, bueno. <risa> Lo que pasa es que con los transgénicos uno no puede solo ver la parte positiva o la parte negativa. ¿no? Tiene que comprar el combo, el paquete completo. ¿no? Entonces, es por eso que uno debe, debe evaluar. Claro que hay cosas positivas, como digo, si no, no se hubieran extendido tanto. ¿no? Reduce costos. En, en Brasil, en Argentina, cuando empezaron a utilizar uh, los transgénicos, pues se dieron cuenta que, que bajaban uh, costos de deshierve, costos de, de eliminación de maleza por otros medios. Este, entonces, a, hay un tema de reducción de costos, en algunos casos de productividad, pero, repito, eso uno tiene que sopesarlo versus los problemas que tiene, ¿no? Y tiene que sopesarlo versus las complicaciones, como, como, como los temas ampliamente mencionados por, por Angélica y yo mismo, tratando de guardar. Entonces, para resumir la, la, la respuesta... Los transgénicos vienen en combo, ¿eh? con positivo y negativo. Buenísimo. Angélica, ¿alguna pregunta? Um, yes, that, that's exactly true. And it comes with a package and it is contextual specific. So what might work in one in socioeconomic, socioecological environment may not be the case in another one. So, for example, the stark differences between Latin American industrial systems versus smaller systems or more ecological systems in my country, for example, it will, uh, the same technology package will unfold completely differently, you know, and it will, it will either generate a benefit or not, and it might even generate more costs, or you might be able to achieve the same uh, goals by using another Um, package that is more competitive and more suitable for that environment. So that's very difficult to say, like, is there any positive or any negative? I'm sure the farmers, the big farmers uh, in Brazil who are using it, they're, they're finding something positive uh, in terms of economics. But um, what we have found also is that so for, for the European production systems, it's been um, largely not competitive with uh, our context, socioeconomic, socioecological context, um, except in Spain to some degree, if it's a fairly limited market, a limited use kind of where they are uh, operating in. But also I must say, and that's what brought me, what I initially said, I'm moving now more towards agroecology and alternative you know, trans transformation of these systems. They were designed for industrial systems. So the less industrial your system is, the less suitable they are. And if we want to move away from, and these industrial systems have a ton of problems uh, other than ruining our climate, it's ruining the soil, it's ruining the water. It's, you know, there's a lot of problems coming along with it that we all have to pay on top of that, you know, by, you know, the government has to clean up the water and et cetera. So in Europe, at least, there is a strong movement now, I can say, that is pushing at the political level that we get out of that, that these systems must be transformed. And then the, a herbicide tolerant plant is, is useless. You know, if you don't want to use Roundup anymore, um, why would you want, you know, it's not an option that is attractive to a to an environmentally, um, you know, an ecological production system, you, you don't need herbicide tolerant plants. 
Me quedan dos preguntas más que, que son bien, eh, ya, ya no tanto de contextual en relación a, a la aprobación o no de, de, del, del uso de los transgénicos, sino a la parte científica. Eh, preguntan eh, si el hecho de que un organismo genéticamente modificado pueda generar tolerancia a los insecticidas, a las pestes, o crear superpestes, ¿se podría comparar a un, a un uso inadecuado de antibióticos? Esa sería la primera. Eh, yo, yo, yo uh, uh, Angélica va a hablar con mayor yes, autoridad sobre it's the el same tema. It's the evolution of resistance. You hear me? Sí, es la, la evolución de la resistencia, pero Alan también okay. tenía. Punto so de yes, the principles are the same. Um, that apply, of course, the anti the insecticide trait is not an antibiotic trait. That's clear. But you can compare it to the evolution of resistance against antibiotics. The principle is the same. It's, it's evolution, it's the force of selection. So if you, if you keep exposing populations to one particular compound over and over and over again, you are selecting and giving those individuals in the populations an advantage, a competitive advantage that can sustain this. Okay, and it may start slow that you can just uh, sustain a little bit and then you mate with another partner that has the same trait and then you become a homozygote resistant ones. And so it's the same evolutionary principle of genetics or population genetics that are at work, whether it's microbes, insects, what have you. It's never a good idea to just use one means. You need diversity at every level. Uh, that's how our planet functions, and if you violate those rules, you will pay the price. Sí, este, yo quisiera una palabrita sobre los antibióticos, ¿no? Donde está aún más demostrado las implicaciones de resistencia, porque ¿cuál es el tema con los antibióticos? Los antibióticos se los ponen a los animales, estoy hablando de antibióticos en animales. Uno consume esa carne y está consumiendo el antibiótico. Además de eso, por ejemplo, en los deyectos de, de, de los animales, van las aves, comen algunas semillas, lo llevan a, a, a donde hay fuentes de agua, contaminan el agua con antibióticos y es por eso que indirectamente todos los días estamos consumiendo antibióticos de una u otra forma y esos antibióticos pues nos están generando resistencia cuando uno necesita tratarse con antibióticos, no le funciona ahí el antibiótico y eso es algo con la suficiente evidencia científica, que uno ya tenemos una este, inmunidad a los antibióticos. Entonces, cuando ya los necesitamos, ¿no? y por eso es que aparecen las superbacterias, etc. ¿no? Entonces, pero sí coincido, el principio es el mismo y, y, y hay riesgo muy serio con el tema de antibióticos. ¿no? Acá demostramos todos los días que Darwin tenía razón. Eh, la última pregunta de índole, también bastante científica, es si existe un punto de quiebre en el proceso de modificación genética o inserción de genes, eh, específicamente para la resiliencia contra plagas y pestes. ¿Llegamos a un límite tras el cual ya no podemos seguir modificando el genoma? ¿O eh, hay un, hay, o sea, cuántas modificaciones puede aceptar un organismo si hay investigación al respecto? Hey. Esa pregunta no es para mí. Um, uh, okay. I, I, and I cannot, and nobody can answer that yet. We don't know. I mean, it's trial and error. Maybe, maybe some molecular biologists have an idea, but I cannot, I couldn't spit out the number. No, yo tampoco. No, no, no. no. De, de repente recurrimos a lo que hace un rato mencionó Angélica, que no es la... Algo no es la suma de sus partes, sino que hay que tener en cuenta las interacciones. Por eso es tan difícil dar esa respuesta. Y así como tenemos que darnos cuenta que, que tenemos que tener un enfoque ecosistémico, también a la interna del funcionamiento de los seres vivos hay, hay demasiadas interacciones que dificultan la respuesta a esa pregunta. Eh, bueno, ya se nos acaba el tiempo. Yo quería agradecerles a... a... Quería agradecer que las preguntas han estado muy interesantes. Estoy segura que la, la universidad va a tener bastante material para poder enfocar eh, en algunos de los temas que más interesan levantado. 
eh, yo me quedo con, con algo muy interesante, ¿no? Creo que este, esta discusión lo que nos está demostrando es que no solamente existen las posiciones pro-transgénicos, antitransgénicos, tenemos países que han eh, evaluado la incorporación como España de un tipo de transgénico, estamos hablando de evaluar, por ejemplo, eh, algunas especies que no sean de uso alimentario, como el caso del algodón, en fin, o sea, eh, son muchas cosas que todavía tienen que seguir eh, analizándose, tenemos que tener obviamente el contexto país, somos un país megadiverso, eh, identificar aquellos cultivos que, que no debamos perder, y también desde el punto de vista comercial, porque finalmente hay mercados que demandan, eh, ahora eh, son mercados nichos que le dan valor a, a algunos, algunas características, entonces todo eso tiene que ser sopesado, y no necesariamente la estrategia país es blanca o negra, y creo que este, este, estos conversatorios que van a ser periódicos nos van a ir ayudando a analizar cada uno de estos elementos. Entonces, sin, sin más, yo quería darle paso a, a Carisa para que, para que termine el conversatorio y agradecer nuevamente la invitación a, a esta conversación tan interesante. No, fue un gusto, ¿eh? muchas gracias. Thank you very much, most welcome. Yes, please protect your biodiversity. We need, you know, we're running out of diversity and you are one of the countries that are still having really sizable diversity left. You, my plan would be protected. Buenísimo. Sí, definitivamente la biodiversidad es, es uno de los factores más importantes a ponderar. Y, y bueno, ver cómo eh, la ciencia también nos puede ayudar con otras alternativas o con alternativas modificadas. Yes. La discusión yeah, tiene... Estamos buscando a Carissa que está con él. Acá estoy, acá estoy. Es que... No, ¿Me escuchan? Sí, te escuchamos, Carissa. Es que yo no tenía el poder de mi audio ni de mi video. Alguien <risa> más tenía el control. <risa> Bueno, les agradezco a, a los tres, a Pamela, a Angélica, a Alan, por estar acá, por estar disponibles para esta conversación. Para nosotros es fundamental eh, tener, tener las visiones de especialistas como ustedes, porque efectivamente, como decía Pamela, nuestro país es un país particular, ¿no? Está dentro de un grupo de países mega diversos en donde de pronto tenemos que considerar la conservación de nuestras especies, ¿no? Eh, eso sin eh, quitar el, lo importante que es el desarrollo científico, ¿no? Pero evaluando nuestros, nuestros pros y nuestros contras, y de, definitivamente los, los transgénicos no eh, solo se... Eh, se desarrollan y se piensan para la agricultura y para la salud, sino es un, camp es un, es un campo bastante amplio ¿no? y cada uno tiene sus especificaciones. ¿no? Entonces es muy interesante, yo he aprendido muchísimo, eh, espero que las personas que nos han acompañado ahora también, he visto todas las preguntas, he visto preguntas de nuestros estudiantes y de la comunidad astronómica y del público en general, muy interesado y lo más importante para nosotros es que cada uno pueda formarse. Como dijo Alan en el comienzo, hay un poder inmenso en el consumidor, en la presión del consumidor y sobre todo en el consumidor informado. Nosotros como consumidores cambiamos el mercado, lo cambiamos radicalmente, lo modificamos, depende de nosotros y de lo que nosotros compremos, lo que existe, la oferta que existe en el mercado. Cuanto más informados estemos nosotros como consumidores, más podemos regular lo que nosotros consumimos. Acuérdense que nosotros somos lo que compramos y nosotros exigimos que haya una regulación en las etiquetas y que nosotros queremos saber qué cosa comemos y también queremos comer alimentos de buena calidad, pero a buenos precios que sean accesibles para nosotros, nosotros es tarea de nosotros como consumidores estar informados y buscar la información adecuada. ¿no? Este, les agradezco nuevamente, yo estoy encantada, estamos felices de haberlos tenido acá y creo que vamos a tener que invitarlos para otras cosas más específicas. <risa> Porque nos ha quedado corto. Oh, cuando guste, ¿no? Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And good luck with everything. Gracias. Bye bye.
Hasta una próxima, ahí nos vemos. Mucho éxito. Adiós, gracias. Gracias por invitarme. Chao, chao.